All right. Thank you everyone for having me um, here, especially Glenn. So I will today talk not at all about a solution, but instead I will talk about a problem and about why it's a problem and some things that we can think about as we begin to solve this on problem. And so it's really almost kind of like an open problems proposal and a plea to this group um, to please help and solve these problems because I think this is kind of like a, the right group uh, to begin thinking about that. So the current state of designing markets for, for data is that we're great. We have free online services, I get free email, I get free search engines, I get free, I get free social network connections, great. These things are not free. Um, um, and in fact, we actually pay for like, online services through the use of our data. And so here, we do things like um, this. Do I have a laser? Good. Um, um, how really, I'm exchanging things about my location, about my image, about, about my friends, um, in exchange for the ability to share cat pictures with my friends. Um, does that seem like a fair trade? I'm not so sure. Um, and the point behind this or kind of like a, the main assumption is that well, like you know, I derive joy from this. I really enjoy sharing cat photos, and so therefore, I don't have to be paid for the work that I'm doing and the data that I provide to these large tech, tech firms. Again, something seems flawed in this logic, and we use the same logic um, several decades ago by saying, well, you know what, women derive joy from from doing like um, household work and from child rearing, and so therefore they don't have to be paid, and that labor doesn't have to be counted into our like um, GDP because they like you know derive joy from it, and so this isn't a thing that deserves to have a market around it. And today we no longer think that, um, and I claim that we should also change our thinking about viewing data generation as labor that deserves to be regulated in a market. Um, and we already kind of do this. We have a thing that's called like um, Amazon Turk. Who here has like heard, heard of it, seen it, used it? <laughs> good, okay. <laughs> All right, good. And so this is an existing market for buying data, although it's really used um, um, for a very small, very limited, uh, like a collection of tasks. For example, I might pay you a few cents um, to draw boxes around like um, stop signs. I may show you a photo and ask you to assign this a label kitchen, living room, bathroom. And so we're doing this and we're paying people for this data, but it's really not the most exciting data um, and, and, and it probably does not spark joy. Um, but actually, we would really like to have this kind of um, data in the future. I've also, I've also given myself privacy, but not my cat. <laughs> I have my privacy here. Um, um, it's like really in the future, we might want to answer questions like, you know, so yes, there was a geo tag here, but like specifically where in Atlanta were you? Why? Why were you there? Do you go there, there, there often? Who is in this um, photo? And what is the um, context? For example, why did you post it? Um, is there some kind of like action hap happening here? And I also tagged my, my cat. And, and yes, she does have her own Instagram. Um, um, so I might want, want to, to know about my like, relationship. And we currently do have like a very strong machine learning algorithms that can like um, kind of make inferences of the sorts, but I claim but I claim really humans are gonna be doing a much better job. For example here, caption says like um says like um says like um Helen with bay and like a heart emoji. And so any kind of like uh, text analysis might assume this is a picture of a like you know human couple um, but in fact, any, <laughs> I'm just saying, just like a text analysis, 
But of course, any human might say, well, in fact, that's a cat. And the cat looks um, somewhat unpleased uh, to be a part of this. And so maybe this is like an ironic caption. And that may also tell you things about this question about the like, um, relationship. OK, and so these are the kind of things that we would like to do. And we can't really, do, and we can't really just like, uh, plug this into Turk. Um, for a few reasons. First of all, this is personal data. Um, I may not consent um, to having these things shared, labeled. Also, it's really hard to like um, check if a person did this correctly. But it's really easy um, to go back and ask if I actually put a box around a um, stop sign. It's really hard to like check that I correctly gave the context of this photo. And so really, I think that if, that if we want to incentivize people to provide this kind of like high quality data inputs, we also have to incentivize them, because that's kind of a lot of work. And so before I talk about these kind of like market design questions, I want to say profits are not inherently bad. I think it's really easy for us to say, well, that tech company is making a bunch of, a bunch of, um, a bunch of um, money. That's bad. That's evil. And it's really not. Um, um, so I'm going to draw analogies to just like a trade across nations. See, there's one country that has a great like um, gold mine, and there's one country that is great at making clocks. It makes sense for these two countries to trade and then build some other manufactured product. And so maybe country A will sell gold to like um, country B, and they will make watches, and those profits will go back down, and then will be like I'm split in some fair way across those two countries. And we call this gains from, from trade, which is really saying that when different countries or different companies have different production capacities, everyone gains. Everyone, everyone wins. And we're kind of seeing the same thing. Um, in terms of designing personal data and plugging that into some like machine learning algorithms, and then we get like um, very highly targeted ads. This is actually one that I saw saw last night, and so like uh, prop Instagram for giving me the like uh, correct ads. <laughs> <laughs> and so, and so really here, users provide the raw materials to these large firms, and they then plug that into machine learning um, to give some kind of some kind of like um, output and the payment goes back this way but a problem here in the ad space is that there's a missing step here and so there's money that flows here but no money flows here and so this is a part where we kind of miss a chance um, to really think about this as a as a market here because there's currently no payments being, being made there. And so now if we agree, OK, so it makes sense. Payments should flow. How much? Right? And so like, what's a fair price for your data? And that's kind of a very big and very nuanced question. Fortunately, we have been thinking about how to price objects for several centuries now. Um, <laughs> Um, and things started started with the like invisible hand, which is that like you know prices move markets, um, and we then saw back in the like early 1800s laws about how like um, supply must equal demand, and then we saw well maybe markets don't always work in that way, and so maybe supply doesn't equal demand, and maybe prices don't actually move markets. Um, and then in this country, there's even a like on a well prize for the practice of market design. And so this is, and these are really just kind of the like um, greatest hits, of course, like a whole lot more work has been done in, in, in this space. The main point is, is that we have like, a whole bunch of tools um, to think about market design. And the main idea um, in these points as a notion of a like market clearing price, which is, 
which is like, you know, imagine if I can find some price of which the people who want to sell are the same as the people who want to, to like buy, and I can find some kind of like magical price at which the supply equals um, demand. And so of course, this has been like a whole bunch of um, debate about about the cases in which this does or, or like um, doesn't work. Um, but this is kind of like uh, the main point is really, I want to find the right price so that people want to sell and buy. And so why can't we just apply tools from this large body of work uh, to price data? And the answer is like, we kind of can, but it's not at all immediate. Do we actually need, need like um, a whole bunch more tools as we talk about data? Um, and so I'm now gonna, going to talk through like a pretty long list of these things. This is by no means a like a comprehensive list. And like also a bunch of the things that appear on on this list have going to be solved already or there exists work on them including some folks in this room. Um, but these all have to be solved together and so that's the big challenge. So first this notion of market clearing prices isn't really well defined because there's actually just like an infinite supply of data about ourselves. I can always create more things. I can tell you more about my preferences or my location or my friends. And so I can never really find a case where supply is going to like equal demand. And this is known as the like on digital goods problem. One more challenge to the personal data um, is often unverifiable, meaning that you can lie about it. And we do have and we do have like um, some tools in this case, as we heard about about well, this morning, like uh, prediction markets can um, help. Um, I mean, they're very good at predicting like uh, binary outcomes. For example, like you know, who do you think is going to win in the next like um, sports event? Um, but it's not very great at like asking if I appropriately labeled a picture of my cat. That's kind of, it's a much more sort of like nuanced approach um, and people can lie or can give just like a partial information. Also, there's like a network nature of like data. And so imagine if I post a picture of myself and three of my friends and we're gonna price data, um, who gets paid? Is it me? Is it my friends? Do we split it? Do I get more because I'm the one who like um, po posted it? What if it's like a picture of them and I'm just like in the background, right? I mean, these are all very nuanced questions. And more broadly, if one person provides data about themselves, and that also tells you a whole lot about people who are like them. And we also don't have a very well-defined notion of what people like you are. And as we get better and better machine learning, we can draw inferences about a broader pool um, of like individuals who are like you in some aspect or like another. Um, and so really it's unclear how to pay for some networked data. And also some people's data may be more valuable. Maybe there's some like um, quality issues. Maybe some people are like, you know, great at providing annotations of, of their photos. Maybe some people don't go outside very much and so they don't actually have a lot of like valuable information. And so we should certainly pay different people based upon the relative value of their data, although we don't currently have a definition of what better data means. Um, and so that's also a thing that we have to like incorporate into our pricing and we don't really know how to make that like a precise yet. And there's also an issue of like a combining multiple data sets, right? And so maybe I have everyone's public voter rec records and you have information about people's anonymized, anonymized like um, health records. On their own, these two things are not incredibly valuable, but if you combine them and you can link them, um, now you have learned a whole lot of information about a whole lot of like, individuals. And so then in terms of the value of kind of like one person's data, maybe I can do like a whole bunch of analysis if I have like a very large data set, what if I could do like approximately the same inference with, if I have like one fewer person's data? Um, I mean, if I have like a million observations and I have one more, will that like, you know, million and first is, is, is pretty meaningless. 
to me because I can make the same inferences without them. And so then how can we pay people for, the, for their data when the aggregate is very valuable, but kind of like each individual person's data is approximately worthless? Um, also, there's some like a consent issues. If I decide your data are approximately worthless, I say like, you know, I'll pay you, I'll pay you like um, 20 cents for your entire contact list and you say like, no thank you. Um, now we have a problem where now like um, some people are going to like opt out and kind of like a fair price for their data is not enough to incentivize them uh, to want to share that. that. Um, um, and this also gets like very entangled as we think about back to this like networked issue. How do we provide consent for like um, someone else to share their, their data that may reveal information about me? And more broadly, people don't really understand the value of their data. And they don't understand privacy. They don't understand why they might want, want privacy or why they may not want their data to be shared. Um, and this is partially addressed in the field of like uh, behavioral economics, although it's like applications into privacy are still are still are still like uh, pretty new. And it has mostly shown people behave wildly irrationally um, when it comes to like protecting their data and their privacy. Um, there was a recent performance art piece um, where the artist asked people to share their mother's maiden name, the last four digits, digits of, of their social, their photograph and their fingerprint in exchange for a cookie. And like by and large, people did this. <laughs> so it's like certainly this is a big challenge because a lot of our market design tools assume that we know the value of the thing for sale. And if we don't, don't know that, we don't even know how, how to like begin to address that. And a part of the problem here is that the like, downstream uses of data are very poorly un understood. If I, give you, if I give you personal information today, how is that going to be used tomorrow? Is it just targeted ads? Are you going to like, uh, price my insurance dif differently? Are you gonna, gonna just like, um, post it online for the world to see? I don't know. And so it's also hard to think about, uh, think about how to value a thing when like, I don't really know what that thing is. And there's also a problem of like, I'm incorporating this into existing tools for like privacy, security, data management. Imagine if I could like uh, promise you, I'm not, I'm not gonna use your data besides, these, besides like, um, these three tasks. How can I convince you that I'm actually going to adhere to that? And so we also have to incorporate tools for kind of like data management, trust, privacy, um, to make sure that the promises made in these, in these um, markets are, are like actually kept. And the last point is that really if we acknowledge that what we're doing online is not just posting cat, cat pictures for like our friends, we're actually generating a, a product for a company's profit, that may change how we interact online, it may change how we perceive what happens on the, on the like, internet, and it will also change the way in which we create data. Uh, and so if this is, is much more kind of like openly, openly discussed, it may change a whole lot of how the like, internet ecos system works just because of this fact. And so I'm supposed to be talking about decentralization, um, um, and I haven't really yet. Um, and so how does decentralization play a role in, in this? So there's one key point, which is that right now, companies are getting our data for our free, and if I want to like um, propose that we change things and start to pay people, they're naturally not going to like it. And also, if you think about these like large tech firms, they more or less own the internet. And so, and so it isn't really an option for me to just say, to say like, you know, please change this. I don't like it. They're going to say like, okay, well, I have like you know a billion other users, and I don't actually care about you. 
Um, and so this is going to be the topic of the next talk. <laughs> Monopsony power, how there is like one single powerful buyer and a whole bunch of pretty powerless <laughs> sellers. And this is really the case here, and I won't say much more because, of course, we're going to hear a like um, whole, a whole <laughs> talk about it. And so really, what does decentralization look like here? Maybe it would mean making more large tech companies, and then they'll have to like um, compete for our data. But that isn't like actually a thing that we can enforce. I mean, we can't cause large companies to like uh, spring into existence. And so instead, I claim decentralization is, is like actually more about just like I'm um, giving market power to the users. And so back in this picture. If it was ever the case in which like a country B stopped paying country A for gold, then a country A and just say, I'm not going to sell gold anymore anymore. Good luck trying to make watches. And so these two would just like would just like negotiate until a trade began again. But here, we're not getting these payments. We also don't have the ability to like a bargain to just like a collectively stop providing materials for this input because there are like so many other people um, who are going to like a continue to like a provide data. And so this now opens a space um, to begin thinking about data unions. And the goal of a union broadly is to give like a collective bargaining power to large groups of individuals who like by themselves are not powerful, but as a group can, can be. And so perhaps the existence of a data union would be able to just like negotiate like payments on behalf of its um, participants. And these unions might behave in the, in the um, following way. They may like um, hold data from like a large group and they could then grant access to this large collective data set um, for approved companies and for approved uses. And approved here would be approved um, by the like uh, collective decision making of the like, individuals who belong to that e union. And we also don't want to think about just one union makes sense. Um, to think about like a whole bunch of different ones. For example, I probably want to have different policies and different governing rules if I think about, about an example where I'm going to have, have some like uh, doctors providing medical advice versus people drawing squares around stop signs. I probably want these two things to behave like very differently in terms of the policies, in terms of the like um, membership agreements, and in terms of the like um, payment schemes. And so it makes sense um, to think about, about not just like one, about just one large one, but some like a community of like a whole bunch of different unions. Of course, there are more challenges in making this happen. On the technical side, how can I build secure unions? Because if I want to grant one group the ability to like um, store store personal data from like a whole bunch of people, they really better have good security policies. Um, and I personally am not quite at the point where I would trust any group to really do that well yet. Um, also this notion of, of a strike, which is the kind of like largest threat for, for, for a like um, group of this form, um, it's not feasible to just like threaten to stop using Google. Um, that's not really a feasible thing. Um, and so if this group wants to like organize strikes and they have to have some other like um, technical alternative for the users during that um, strike. And more broadly, how do you build trust? How do you, and also how do you build um, demand? We have to have like a whole bunch of people rise up and say like, um, and say like um, yes, I demand payment for, for my data. Yes, I demand unions who can like uh, collectively bargain on my, on my behalf. And I also trust this particular group um, um, to really do that. 
and we also seem pretty far away from having that be a reality. Um, but that, but that is kind of the like eventual goal. Um, Rachel, yeah, your time is up. Great, thanks. Um, great. And so this is my last slide. Um, and so I'll just, just sort of like um, have this up. But just to say, in the future, it would be great if we had people provide high quality data, and these tech companies made a profit off of that, and the profit was like shared in some appropriate and fair way with the individuals who gave data, and the like um, definition of things being like appropriate and fair is really is really up for like a whole broad debate. Thank you.